uh, until now i wanted to go a little faster uh, because most of the aspects were sort of generic to heat transfer uh, fundamentals uh, now um, what i'll shift towards is more towards a technology focus where uh, what are the technology the tech type of technologies that are typically used uh, in uh, electronics cooling and one one that is often used is the heat sink um, because most of the processes or whatever it may be the heat sinks become the way of dissipating heat from a heat source the uh, heat exchanger in, in occasions in but we are talking about a heat sink that means often with a heat exchanger means often it involves two fluids or three fluids and so on in this case only one fluid is used the heat is being conducted to in this picture that is shown here is a fan that is mounted on top and the heat source is underneath this heat sink here and heat is conducted first as we discussed till now is spread to a large area and then to the fins and the fan blows the air into it and it is in a jet impingement configuration that is the fan will go impinge the air flow generated by the fan will go impinge and exit through these sides so it will exit through that side and this side that is the front and the back side as shown that is often referred as the active heat sink because there is a fan involved in it there are those passive heat sinks uh, where uh, there is no fan involved um, and it is uh, driven by natural convection and what is shown on the right hand side is a metal foam based heat sink these are uh, metal foams are not periodic porous materials stochastic porous uh, materials whose ligaments or whose metal parts are continuous and they have open pores so that the air flow goes through them these are some advanced heat sinks that are not commercially used in the commercial electronics world however they have been uh, discussed and used for military electronics and very niche applications they don't seem to have entered the commercial space because uh, these pores are on the order of two one to three millimeters and it, they may end up becoming more like a, a filter because in uh, in laptops and uh, desktops you see that over a period of time there's a bunch of dust that gets collected on these systems and so uh, we will discuss the first uh, so-called the workhorse in the industry which is the parallel plate or the longitudinal fin heat sinks and uh, develop a very simple uh, guideline for even if you don't do elaborate uh, modeling or design there is a very simple guideline that actually gives close to good uh, performance we'll get we'll we'll discuss discuss that aspect of it then uh, we'll get into the advanced heat sinks that um, tomorrow um, the first part i will cover and the second part uh, i'll uh, there will be professor sri priya ramamurthy who is uh, whose background is in acoustics and uh, noise control she will come and discuss some aspects of acoustics in electronics because we always deal with fans most of the electronics data centers and uh, commercial electronics involve air cooled systems whenever you have air cooled system noise is a is a unwanted bug that just arises and so she will discuss the acoustic aspects of electronics and also some newer designs um, yes of how to do heat dissipation as well as absorb sound within the same functional volume within the same heat sink volume can be absorb sound that is the noise that is generated by the fan as well as dissipate heat in some um, aspects that she will discuss and some 
<clears throat> why we should uh, study noise and so on. So she will do that tomorrow. And um, so as I told you, <laughs> discussed previously very briefly, there are uh, heat sinks can be classified in many ways. However, in a practical sense, there are three uh, situation that arises. One is the so-called uh, heat sink without any tip clearance. The red dash indicates a box that is placed around the heat sink and any airflow that is going into the page. This is a cross section of a heat sink. The blue is the fin, the, the usually the, the base and the bottom thick uh, plate is called a base of a heat sink. And these are the he heat sink fins. Uh, so the flow happens between these and heat is conducted from the bot bottom and it is spread to the base and then into the heat sink fins. And then when air is flown across it, the conducted heat gets dissipated into the air space. And as the air is flowing through them, then the air gets picks up the heat and uh, removes the heat out of that space. So that's how the process happened. And as you can see, there are three critical, uh, we will discuss that a little later. Uh, so this is the simplest configuration one can analyze without much complexity. And that's what I'll discuss today, is this so-called heat sink without tip clearance, where if I look at a pressure drop perspective, um, if there is a certain length of the heat sink, that is the flow according to the flow direction, flow length, then there is a pressure drop associated with it. A moderate complexity is when there is some amount of space on the top. So when there is flow entering into this type of an arrangement, the box is shown again as red, red dash here. And you can see that now the flow has two paths to take, one, two, between the fins, one on top of it. That is, it has two parallel paths. So depending, the flow will take the least resistive path and until the point where the pressure drop across the top space and the bottom between the fins is equal, that's how, uh, then th that will be the splitting point of flow is depending on the pressure drop associated with the top and the bottom space, the flow will either uh, bypass the amount of flow that can be determined only by knowing the pressure drop in the top and the bottom. So now we have an arra arrangement or a situation where one has to understand the impact of that gap that is present over the top of the heat sink. And so that brings parallel paths and the design now becomes uh, challenging. And the third complexity um, based on flow arrangement is that you, you have flow bypass happening on the sides as well, not only on the top, but also on the sides. This is an extremely challenging situation and any improvement in heating in such a situation is, is uh, improvement in performance in such a situation is quite difficult because the air can easily bypass and so one arrangement I'll discuss is that what is shown here is the so-called heat sink thermal resistance. Thermal resistance we describe as the temperature at the bottom as if it was the base temperature being uniform and minus the inlet temperature divided by the power that is dissipated. So that is the thermal resistance that is described here. Oh, one second, uh, there's some noise here, I'll just come back. 
sorry for that just um so if you see here what i am plotting is thermal resistance as a function of number of fins here we i am talking about this as one there are n number of fins here what happens is initially when there is no bypass which is this curve without flow bypass you see that as you keep increasing the number of fins initially the thermal resistance drops and after some point it reaches a minimum uh, thermal resistance because our objective is to decrease the thermal resistance at some point it reaches a minimum value here and then it again rises before discussing flow bypass let's understand why should it decrease and then and then why is it increasing so if we look at the heat flow path when i put a heat source here there are three main paths that needs to be mean the three main mechanisms that we need to understand heat needs to be there is my laser pointer <coughs> so my if i have a heat source on the bottom plane here the heat needs to spread and into the fins so the conduction resistance is offered by that so you have spreading resistance and then spreading and then uh, conducting through the fins itself then it needs to convect the temp and dissipate the heat into the air flow stream so you have conduction and convection on top of it depending on the amount of air flow there is only a certain amount of heat flow uh, he, uh, there is only a certain amount of uh, heat that it can absorb the air flow stream can flow because the maximum temperature the air flow can attain is the temperature of the metal itself if i have a uniform temperature let's say 80 degree fin temperature somehow magically i have a very high efficiency fin then my fin temperature let's assume that it is at 80 degrees c and the base is also at 80 degrees c then the air flow temperature the maximum air flow temperature it can attain even though it is coming in at 20 degrees c is that 80 degrees ah uh, so if i have a fan that is dissip that is generating air flow when i have less number of fins here let's say 10 number of fins that means my pressure drop across these fins is very small that means i am able to generate more air flow that means my sensible heat rise the amount of heat carrying capacity of the air flow is higher uh, mcp delta t that is the mass flow times specific heat times the temperature difference across the flow that is inlet uh, outlet minus inlet temperature so that's the amount of heat the air flow can carry that's the maximum amount of heat so that mass flow rate will be higher because my pressure drop is good as i start to put but in this case when there is fewer number of fins the amount of surface area is smaller <coughs> Uh, so my convective heat transfer h a the newton's law of cooling h a delta t here the delta is the surface temperature and a is the surface area of the fin surface temperature minus the reference temperature could be let's say it's inlet temperature of that my convective heat transfer coefficient is is not that high because my fins are spaced far apart so my if you assume the nozzle number for the sake of discussion nozzle number is constant nozzle number is h times hydraulic diameter by thermal conductivity of the fluid so the spacing between the fins is larger that means my hydraulic diameter is larger so as i put more fins my hydraulic diameter keeps decreasing that means my heat transfer coefficient because my right hand side is constant one my heat transfer coefficient keeps increasing as i add more fins and also i am increasing the surface area as i am adding more fins 
however there is equally the amount of airflow generated by the fan is also going down at some point they reach an equilibrium that is the amount uh, not an equilibrium an optimum where the amount of heat convectively lost to the air stream and the amount of heat carrying capacity of air is also um, not uh, the is also equal so at that point you reach a minimum resistance beyond if you add more number of fins the pressure drop generated is so high that the airflow generated is also high now the amount of heat carrying capacity even though a convective heat transfer is being increased the amount of heat carrying capacity of the airflow stream is reduced so the thermal resistance starts to increase again so on this side left side of this minima is limited by the convective heat transfer the right side of this minimum is limited by the sensible heat rise or the heat carrying capacity so that is without my flow bypass on the other hand yes please okay, sir yeah uh, so what are the uh, mechanism that you have described this is equally true for natural convection as well uh it is true yeah okay because uh, in the natural convection the in the on the right side uh, there will be the increase in the heat thermal resistance that may be because of the blocking of the flow because the fins are very close and right. uh, and and there are the this uh, hot air is get blocked within these two consecutive fins and uh, that causes a uh, resistance to convection am i am, right. am I right sir yeah so as you put more fins now natural convective flow is restricted because restricted. right 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 sir thank you sir yeah. so now now we add a flow bypass essentially a situation that happens here is that now this curve looks very similar to the no flow bypass case but the the minimum resistance for this flow bypass is higher than the minimum resistance without the flow bypass the reason being that at some point the pressure drop across this so if i'm looking at a simple situation that if i treat it as a parallel two for flow paths two parallel flow paths then at this minimum point the flow bypass effect is taking that there is more airflow uh, that is happening on the top side and the amount of airflow if it was ducted can be even more higher in this case than the bottom case so the flow bypass always restricts the amount of heat that can be dissipated by the seam heat sink and that's why designing for flow by bypass is actually more challenging and still there are open ended questions even though there are some correlations and others the open ended question still exists about how to model these flow bypass effects and so that's a very simple parallel plate heat sink however you can record it from uh, pin fin heat sinks others and so on and so forth so that is the classification based on flow arrangement but there are innumerable number of uh, classification based on the type and uh, or like this is the longitudinal fins or parallel plate fins these are the foam based fins here again what you have is the, this is the heat pipe embedded heat sinks where this bottom surface uh, bottom plane is placed on top of a heat source or a processor abridged by a thermal interface material and these are heat pipes heat pipes are uh, fairly good conductors of heat better than even better than copper if designed well and they can transport heat uh, more effectively than copper in this case there are these heat pipes conducting heat to the top and where there are parallel plate heat sinks many times what happens in in these uh, air cooling enhancement is that treating these longitudinal fins becomes extremely challenging you will find uh, i have been working in this area for more than uh, now close to 16 years uh, Treating these parallel plate fins has become an extremely challenging affair. Uh, 
not purely from a heat transfer perspective but you shouldn't allow any penalty if i want to have same pressure drop and have higher heat transfer coefficient or higher heat dissipation from a new structure you will find that parallel plate fins are as good as anything else and uh, it is a very challenging endeavor to beat the fa parallel plate fins yes there, there are people have shown but it is not like twice or thrice on equal pressure top basis you always get 10% 15% if you target 50% 100% improvement it actually becomes extremely challenging and i don't think there exists much work in that area anyway um coming back to this <clears throat> sir one small question along the longitudinal fins ah um if you split up so there is one longitudinal fin which is uh, you, you can see it's a rectangular one ah. what happens if i uh, cut it out and then make it also like a fin like smaller fins placed next ah. to each other so Would it all like this ah uh, yes yes correct yes yeah so that so what happens here is the situation that uh, now your boundary layer sort of grows from the surface and it gets disrupted and it again starts any time you do that there is always associated pressure drop penalty as well the pressure drop also increases so what you will end up finding is that it will show better performance from a heat transfer perspective that is you will dissipate heat slightly higher than this case from a equal velocity if i say my velocity inlet is kept constant at 4 meter per second you will find that strip these are so called strip fin heat sinks they will tend to have slightly higher or this is the so called offset strip fin this is in line you are not changing in in occasions they smooth this in a staggering fashion we we'll find that for 4 meter per second for this case it will be better however if i use if i fix the pressure drop let's say 15 or 20 pascals or 50 pascals i'll find that this actually ends up being better so it depends on whether you are accepting that penalty the slight increase in penalty for higher heat transfer but there are so many papers in this that it is uh, very very hard to um papers and products and so on it is very hard to judge whether it is because it is hard to each heat sink is different size uh, it is hard to compare each of them one may claim that this is better than that or something like that uh, but if you have to compare them equally on a equal platform it is very very hard because the geometric scaling and others that uh, people have used for flow through deep and that type of it be readily apply is not readily applied for heat sinks uh, because once i change my heat sink then i'm or shape or geometry i'm in a different regime so i can't compare them on equal footing um however this this so called zipper fin is what you will if you open a laptop you will find most of the fins are like this and uh, this has become a extremely low cost in many of these commercial electronics uh cost is a bigger player than any performance improvement because they budget about uh, a certain money and you have to fit your cooling solution within that money and they can compromise a little bit on the performance by doing some other change to it but cost becomes a real factor driving factor so many people even if there is 15 20% improvement they will settle for lower cost if the cost that one one entails for enhanced performance is much higher um then they will not be accepting 50% higher cost for 20% improvement in performance so that's why this parallel plate fins have become the real workhorse in many you will see 
desktop, laptop, servers, you'll find that they tend to have even this so called e pipe embedded fins. These are parallel plate fins, as you can see. They are this frames. <clears throat> Again, now you can classify these heat sink based on flow structures. Uh, either they can be laminar or turbulent. Here's a flow over a cylinder. You can see some complex flow structures. As Dr. Rajat pointed out, if I have um, a strip fin, what ends up happening is that the boundary layer or the flow gets separated and it creates some kind of wave or wake, essentially not wave, and impinges on the next and that influenced the previous as well. And that type of thing can be observed here. There's a flow visualization with water, not with air, but it is equally valid. <coughs> is that if you may have heard that in an internal flow situation around 2000 Reynolds number, you start to see turbulent flow, but transition to turbulence happens in these fins little earlier than 2000 because of this uh, influence effect. You can see at 750, the flow is fairly laminar. That is, it's not, it's going straight path. There is no, however, at around 1000, now you start to see these small wake effects and they start to mix. And around 1800, now you start to see much more effect of these disturbances. <clears throat> and you actually are in, <laughs> even about 1000 runners number, it actually is in the turbulent regime uh, for these cases. So uh, there are many, many uh, options um, in terms of how to classify this. So it is better not to get too carried away by the classification and putting a structure around it. Uh, heat transfer coefficient, I've already talked, um, so I'll skip that. How do I model? Because parallel plate heat sinks or the longitudinal fin heat sinks are one of the workhorses. Uh, people have developed a lot of correlations and uh, very simple modeling procedures. And one of the simplest ways is the so-called first order model, where you develop a friction factor correlation as a function of developing flows here. So there are two pressure drops that are associated with the heat sinks. One is the so-called core pressure drop that is pressure drop associated by um, because of the flow friction happening when the flow is going through the fins. And the second because the flow from a larger area is constricted to go through the fins. That is called loss, entry loss. And similar exit loss happens where the flow from a smaller channel between the fins is expanded to a larger duct. So that's the inlet and exit pressure drop. They are all char characterized by this equation. Very simple. This F apparent is the friction factor, apparent friction factor. And IEX is the developing flow situation here. So this then, uh, as you can see, this 23.73 is fully developed flow limit. Um, <coughs> so always, uh, in heat transfer, and there is this fanning friction factor and Darcy friction factor, so it has to be carried. With. There is a multiplying factor called four here, and uh, so this 23.7366 is the parallel plate limit at fully developed flow conditions. But when there is developing flows, then this X plus needs to be calculated. X plus is nothing but uh, it's the inverse of Greig's number. It is given here, length. That is the length. Hydraulic diameter. Hydraulic diameter is based on the spacing between the fins. Um, essentially, you will have two times WC times HC divided by WC plus HC. That's the hydraulic diameter. And this is the so called inlet. Uh, um, this K inlet is the loss coefficient uh, for the entry loss. K exit is the loss coefficient for exit losses. And this is actually, a, uh, I've used it and I've verified it experimentally as well. It works very well. 
is within 15% accuracy of uh, experiments. So as far as uh, very simple calculation goes, this relationship can be used if the flow conditions are correct. On the other hand, there is a huge confusion with this parallel flow fixing model from a first order perspective. The resistance, as I discussed to you, is the base temperature that will be the heat sink temperature, heat sink base temperature at the bottom plane minus inlet air temperature divided by the amount of power or heat dissipated by the heat sink. That is the thermal resistance of a heat sink. And there are <clears throat> really bad models out there in the literature. And there are, <clears throat> they are to be carefully looked up before uh, some well-known people who have worked in this area for more than 40, 50 years also have done this mistake of using wrong models because some student may have done it. However, um, there is something called this so, uh, convective resistance model. What it is is given by this relationship, which is 1 by heat transfer coefficient. Again, the confusion of what heat transfer coefficient needs to be carefully looked at. A effective is the effective surface area of the heat sink. This, what it does is that this is a heat, this model is called convective resistance model. But this model, as you can see, is going to give um, a, a perspective that as long as you keep increasing your mass, flow rate, this heat transfer coefficient will keep increasing. That means this resistance will always drop with increasing mass flow rate. That will be the trend predicted by this equation. <clears throat> However, as I described to you, when the pins become much closer and closer, the effect of amount of heat that can be carried by the heat sink um, airflow reduces. So that mass flow sensible heat rise is not captured by this model. So that is a problem with this. And there are models that <clears throat> at the sensible heat rise to be added like this, MCP delta T, and they, are, they call it the fluid resistance model or something. MCP delta T, which is the energy balance that comes from energy balance, it is not a resistance. It is an effect caused by the heat being dumped into that air stream. So it cannot be used as, as a resistance because it is the amount of heat that was dumped into the airflow stream. So the airflow temperature went up from some value X to some value X plus delta X. So using that X plus delta X minus X as a temperature driving force or the voltage difference is wrong. But some people have done this and this is a very badly done model. It is true only under one situation that the entire heat sink sees one mixed mean temperature. There is one bulk mean temperature for the entire heat sink. So it's thermodynamically wrong and people have done that mistake. Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, this uh, first model, convective resistance model, the correlation that is needed for doing that model is shown here. I will leave it uh, just for your reference. However, one of the best way to do it is this um, heat exchanger theory. Um, so maybe I should do it on the board. Just one second, I'll connect my camera to the board. Oops. 
Can you see my board? Yes, sir. Ah, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> So if I uh, have a heat sink, <laughs> Sorry for bad drawing, but uh, nevertheless, if I were to draw the temperature profile of this temperature as a function of x, let's call this x direction. I find that uh, my temperature of the solid pin will look something like this. <coughs> However, my temperature of the airflow will look like this. That means the airflow will see a large temperature rise compared to the solid pin. So a better model for heat sinks is not uh, thermal resistance for heat sink is not this model of this is valid only when the pins are far apart that one can treat it as if they were uh, you know the density of pins is not high. When you get into higher density pins, then one has to do what is called the heat exchanger theory. One has to make use of the heat exchanger theory and describe the heating resistance as 1 by m dot Cp times epsilon. Epsilon is the effectiveness. And effectiveness of a single stream heat sink, as we all know, effectiveness is defined as Q max by Q actual. Because we have only one fluid that is going through this, we have M dot Cp times temperature of air at the outlet minus temperature of air at inlet divided by M dot, the Q max is usually M dot Cp times the base temperature, the maximum temperature, which is the surface temperature of the solid minus the air in. <clears throat> the minimum, this should always be this so-called minimum. If you look at it, you will find that this temperature profile, this is for the solid and this is for the air. And am I recording this one? Okay. You see, air is the stream that undergoes a lot more temperature change than solid. That means that has the minimum capacity relative to solid. That means this M dot Cp must be air. So if I write it this way, then these two get cancelled. So my effectiveness is nothing but P air outlet minus P air in divided by P surface minus P air in. However, we know the resistance of heat sink I had described to you earlier as P surface minus P inlet or P air inlet divided by the amount of power or heat that was dissipated by that. So, which is the top is the voltage difference, which is the driving force, and Q is the current. 
you can see that <clears throat> you know that by purely energy balance Q is equal to M dot CP times P air outlet minus P air in. That's the amount of heat that was dumped into the air stream. So from here, using the definition of epsilon, I can write it as P surface minus P air in is equal to P air out minus P air in divided by epsilon. I have just replaced it. So if I substitute for, oh, I want the other way around. So T air out minus T air in can be written as epsilon times T surface minus T air in. So if I substitute that, so now I can define R as T surface minus T air in. Divided by Q, which is nothing but one by M dot CP of epsilon. So this is the accurate model for fixing because one can also obtain from this expression, one can also obtain uh, the expression of the so-called convective heat transfer, which is convective resistance model, which is this. From the heat exchanger theory, we can write for a single stream heat exchanger, epsilon is equal to one minus exponential of minus NTU. NTU is number of transfer units. This comes directly from a heat exchanger theory. And from there, you can write it as 1 minus exponential of minus H times A divided by M dot C. NTU is this. <coughs> so, using Taylor series expansion of exponential of minus X is nothing but 1 minus X plus x square by 2 factorial and so on. So just using the linear terms, if I substitute that, this is a Taylor series expansion, epsilon is nothing but 1 minus of minus 1 plus h a by m dot c for p, ignoring all the higher order terms. So epsilon is written as m dot c. If I go substitute it here, in the resistance model, so I'll have 1 by HAS by MC. The A get cancelled and I get 1 by S. So what this is saying is that only at very low limits of this NTU that this convective resistance model works. Whenever the NTU starts to become larger and larger, this convective resistance model doesn't work. <coughs> so, so for fixing purposes, it is always better to use this, even though you will find that very common micro channel is that most people use this model, which is wrong. Uh, it is absolutely wrong, and one should be very careful. Because the same idea of heat sink that where air is going through this is equally valid for water flowing through a micro channel. It doesn't matter. And so most of the literature is full of these type of models or 
there is this new one that is 1 by m dot c this is even worse because that is thermodynamically wrong so, so i just thought it is probably better to just this on board rather than two slides so i'll come back to my slides now So that's what I've discussed here. And the error associated with using, you can see the NTU, which is HA by M dot C sub P that I had described on the board here. If you see that my NTU is small, then the error between the, the two models, which is the one by M dot C sub P heat exchanger theory based model, that is HTX, and the convective resistance model is very small. As the NTU starts to grow to bigger number, the error between the two also grows. So it is important that we use the right uh, theory for modeling these things and cold plates. So that's the first order model. The, if you use the right correlations for heat transfer coefficients and the friction factor, then they actually predict heat sink performance well within 15 to 20 percent. If the right performance, uh, if the right, uh, uh, you know, if, the, if you use the right correlation in terms of whether the flow is developing or fully developed, then you will get really good prediction from just doing a very simple calculation. However, when you have fans, uh, then one has to understand the impact of fans which is to whether the fan is centrifugal axial um, or whatever uh, there are many varieties of fans that are used and in laptops it is very common to see the so-called uh, centrifugal fans and in servers you see most commonly the so-called axial fans uh, or the tube axial fans servers and desktops laptops because you your went went for cap uh, catching the air from is on the back side of your laptop and it pushes the air out through the side. So you you see mostly centrifugal fans there. On the other hand, as I mentioned to you, so you can see here, this side will be the side that faces your lap and this is your vent. Uh, the heat will blow across these heat pipes here, right here. There will be a heat sink underneath this board and it pushes it out through this vent. This is your vent of a laptop. This is a tube axial fan that is often used for, um, you know, um, your um, servers and desktops. So one has to understand this. I've already described to you the fan curve, so I won't spend the time again. However, fan selection is a very critical parameter. And as you may notice that whenever you start a computer, the fan makes a lot of noise. And uh, uh, the reason for that is that they, one of the simplest way, because in many, um, especially in India, we have very dusty, Mumbai is so dusty sometimes, I don't understand where the dust is being generated. However, <laughs> these dust gets collected into our heat sinks and fans and some of them look like this the reason for the whenever you start the laptop uh, there is a the fan makes a lot of noise that is because they tend to spin the opposite direction that they typically do that is to push some of the deposited particles out that's why you see it is spinning in the uh, the polarity is changed at the beginning to push any of the dust that was collected over a period of time out of the laptop system. So that is a, and then only after that, it changes its direction and starts to pull air back into the system. So uh, that is used to, you know, sort of prevent or reduce the amount of dust collected over a period of time. For fan selection, however, there's so many parameters and factors that one often looks into before one picks a given fan. And you will find that most of the manufacturers, once they select a fan, it is, uh, they don't tend to change the fan at all. 
for a, unless it is they are compelled to change it so depending on the volume flow rate required static pressure required uh, space limitation um, because in laptops your height is fixed or they may be uh, to a certain noise generated what is the operating temperature whether the heated air is going to enter the fan or not so on and so forth so so there are so many parameters that uh, one has to look into selection that it seems extremely challenging um, once you change you select a fan to change it so um, so there are fan laws i'm sure you are well aware of it i am listing them is uh, if the fan is <coughs> uh, if there is not big change and you are just changing the diameter of the fan and so on then these fan laws are uh, quite useful i'll skip these fan laws and as you all know if the two fans are placed in series the amount of pressure it can sustain the back pressure it can sustain can be high and if the two fans are put in parallel then the amount of air flow rate generated becomes higher so with that we can now discuss about how to optimize these heat sinks so there are four possible optimization constraints for heat sinks one is fixed mass flow rate of air that is uh, i supply a certain amount of mass flow rate and i am trying to explore uh, is there a optimum second is fixed pressure drop third is fixed pumping power and the fourth one is prescribed fan power fixed or given fan power for the fixed mass flow rate typically uh, when there is no tip clearance there is no optimum because as the amount of air carrying uh, heat carrying capacity of air is fixed when you fix the rate that any heat sink so as long as you keep adding a pin it will keep uh, because you are anyway generating you are not fixing the pressure drop you are saying i am going to give you certain amount of so what will happen as long as you can add pins it will keep increasing its performance so literally there is no real value in in uh, in doing any optimization for a miss fixed mass flow rate and that will always depend on how many number of things that you can put the second one is the fixed pressure drop when you have a fixed pressure drop then you should expect an optimization uh, when you do the optimization you will expect that that uh, there will be a resistance like we discussed for the case of the initially the mechanisms of the heatsink design is that initially it will be limited by the convective heat transport then it will be limited by the amount of heat carrying capacity of the air so the fixed pressure drop will generate uh, versus number of fins or whatever parameter cell size cell the spacing between the fins or something like that uh, if you do any of the uh, optimization then you will find that initially the resistance will drop because you are increasing the surface area and the mass flow rate is not um, is not uh, limited to the amount of that was dumped into it after that after it reaches a minimum it starts to rise up the same behavior can be expected for pumping power constraint as well as fan curve so one of the very simplest uh, methodology that one can use and can quickly get a very good estimate of heat sink uh, geometry is this work by professor bejan and tiuba back in 1992 and um, they used the the so called method of uh, matched asymptotes that i discussed for natural convection but here used for um, uh, force convection um however they have developed this initial work was based on hydrodynamically and thermally developing flow uh, you can look into it for in any type of flow situation that you are interested so what they looked at is a two dimensional geometry they didn't look at the 3d part but you can add the 3d part by doing numerical simulation so if i have a flow going through a stack of fins and the width of the heat sink is h and the length of the heat sink is l then 
as we discussed previously, there are two limits that one can look into for a fixed pressure drop. Is that one is the limit where the fins are placed so closely that right from the beginning you see fully developed fluid. <clears throat> On the other hand, you see a limit where the spacing between the fins are so large that the boundary layers do not merge even at the exit of the fins. Somewhere between the two limits is where the optima exists. And for the sake of discussion, what we are going to ignore is the thickness of the fin. The thickness of the fins that are found in laptops and desktops these days is about 0.2 millimeters, 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters. And uh, so they are quite thin these days. But anyway, they can be easily incorporated. So the first, as we discussed, is the so called deep tending to zero limit fully developed flow limit, where the fin, the blue is the fin, and we are looking at from the top. As the flow enters, it quickly becomes fully developed flow. Essentially, you just, and the boundary layers have merged, and so they have become a fully developed flow. Then the average velocity can be found using a posile flow uh, model, and that is what is given here. Once you know the velocity, because as you can recall that we have fixed the pressure drop across the heat sink as a constant. Once you find the velocity, because we know the pressure drop, now we know at, uh, at this small spacing, D is known, mu is the dynamic viscosity, L is the length of the fin. The mass flow rate per unit depth, depth is going into the page, is given by rho times velocity times H. this h <clears throat> so that is given by the that gives the total mass flow rate per unit depth once i know this because i have reached a fully developed flow what i'm going to assume is that the fins are at uniform temperature t wall that is fin efficiency is assumed to be 100 percent for this so usually when you design a reasonably good heat sink Thin efficiencies tend to be on the order of 90% or higher. So, assuming 100% fin efficiency is not such a bad assumption. However, we fix the temperature of the fin to be T wall. And because it is fully developed flow, what will happen? The wall temperature will imprint itself on the air. So, the airflow will attain the maximum temperature T wall before the exit. So, or at the exit. So the overall heat transferred from this system is given by mass flow rate times specific heat times the delta T across the air. T wall is the maximum temperature air can attain. So T wall minus T infinity is the total mass transfer. Uh, total heat trans transfer. And <clears throat> that is one limit and you can see that the total heat transfer rate from this stack is proportional to d square and that is the spacing between the two fins the other limit why is this The other limit is D tending to infinity. That is the spacing between the fins are so far apart that the boundary layers that are uh, developing, they don't even merge. So in this case, he, uh, Professor Bejan and Siyuba, they had used flat plate correlation. However, we have to keep in mind that there is accelerating flow effects in an internal flow situation. So what they did was to use a flat plate correlation to calculate the amount of heat transfer from these fins. Since there are two fins, they have used two, and n is the number of fins in the stack. Then they calculated total heat transfer rate from all the fins, and they were, they, the total heat transfer 
uh, heat transfer rate at this limit is 1 by d raised to the power 2 by 3. So if we plot d as a function of q, then for one limit, it increases with, that is the fully developed flow limit, the amount of heat transferred increases as a fun as proportional to d square on the other limit it decreases like this and the point where they cross over can be deducted by equating the two heat transfer rates and that is how you obtain the optimum spacing between the fins and that turns out to be however if you really look at this and finally plot it what you will end up seeing is that the best solution is what they what the final outcome comes from this whole discussion is that if you place your fin such that the boundary layers merge just before the exit like this that turns out to be optimal. If you merge the boundary layers very close, that means you have choked the flow. That is, you can't carry any more heat. If you if you if your boundary layers do not merge even before the exit, that means you are not using the cold flow that is coming here. So, a situation where the boundary layers merge just before the exit of the heatsink is the optimal spacing between the that's what emerged out of this uh, discussion and it makes intuitively correct so this um, is a very good starting point for any of the parallel plate heatsink models and uh, that one starts with is to keep the space spacing as <coughs> as equivalent to the thermal development length of that so one puts that, then for a fixed pressure drop, you really see a performance improvement uh, without doing a lot of calculations or doing numerical modeling. So that was one of the important outcomes. And uh, I, I, I have used it and many of my friends and they always find it very, very good point. And once you starting guess correctly then the number of uh, iterations to get to the final design becomes much simpler anyway, so that parallel plate design is quite it can be used for heat exchangers and others as well so if you look at manufacturing perspective because uh, heat sinks typically are manufactured by many many methods the most common ones are the extrusion processes the die casting and the so-called folding and bonding this type where they fold the fins like this or they have extruded fins like this and they get bonded so this is a um, method this folding and bonding method is the most commonly uh, used method these days for um, they don't do this type of folding but instead a c type pin so they make lot of c type and then they just uh, bond it to a base plate so depending on the manufacturing process uh, you may or may not be able to achieve all the fin um, the spacings and so on uh, so one has to when you are designing heat sink one has to keep in mind the design for manufacturing in mind uh, to actually ensure that the heat sink design that you have come up with this can be manufactured for example in an extrusion case um, there are certain limits of what can be what needs to be the delta or the thickness of the fin uh, itself um, what can be the <clears throat> height of the fin to spacing between the fins the aspect ratio should be so the, these are limited by the processes themselves for extrusion the fin thickness uh, cannot be less than 1 mm uh, <clears throat> the height aspect ratio the height of the fin to spacing between the fins cannot be 
more than this eight is to one. Similarly, the spacing between the fins uh, needs to be at least 6.6 .6 millimeters, so on and so forth. So now there are many of these things. And so you, when you draw a thermal resistance versus fin density, number of fins per centimeter, you will find that uh, there are very few modern manufacturing processes like bonded fin technology and the skived fin technology are the very few fins that can give you very high density. So that's why you find that most of the current, uh, currently existing fins in the laptops and desktops are tend to be this folded fin technology that can even go to higher fin densities. But one has to keep in mind the manufacturing to ensure that the design uh, becomes realizable. And that's why I discussed this very briefly. And then we will discuss about the acoustics tomorrow. Um, but the acoustics also plays an important role in all these things. So because the noise cannot exceed a certain maximum going to occupational uh, health, safety, and the OSHA. Uh, And uh, Professor Shripriya will discuss tomorrow about that. But the, if I ha if I'm designing a heat sink for a laptop, then the laptop needs to operate in um, air at higher altitude as well. So there is a change in density. You need to ensure that the or if it is being used in a modern day submarine or something, then it has to operate there as well. So this. It seems has to keep in mind the altitude effect as well and the factor that needs to be. Um, <clears throat> there are some very simple factors that people have come up with. Uh, and for example, here is an example. At sea level 3000 meters, then if you calculate a resist, resistant heatsink resistance at sea level, then you divide by that factor. So the resistance keeps increasing as you go to higher and higher altitudes. <clears throat> for example, if you go to 3,500 meters, then your heatsink resistance will be divided by 0.75. That means the resistance went up significantly. So one has to ensure the altitude effects are taken into account when uh, someone designs these heatsinks as well. In practical situation, there are so many parameters that come into picture. Uh, as these are the prescribed parameters, we know how much heat dissipation, what the ambient temperature needs to be, maximum heat sink temperature, velocity, all these things. So one is always required to calculate <coughs> fin height, thickness, spacing, length, base plate thickness, what is the material of the heat sink, and the complicating factor is whether the flow is turbulent flow, this flow, that flow, fouling. Fouling is one of the real challenging situation, how much of the it degrades as you collect dust is very hard to predict our people have done some experiments by doing particle loading and but prediction is still lacking in the, in, in those areas um, <clears throat> so we've discussed this uh, bypass effect and so on so i'll so the next is to go to somewhat on the complex side I'll take a break here and just ask you if there are questions about what I've covered. No, sir. <laughs> you have any questions for me? I'm assuming none, so I will proceed. And uh, there's about only 20 minutes. I'll spend a few minutes on this. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, I will spend a few minutes on the advanced uh, complex structured heat sinks uh, and um, maybe pick up more on the details in the next tomorrow, essentially. So. Once you get out of this parallel plate heatsink domain, there are innumerable number of designs as we discussed. Uh, there are so many options, so many people have investigated this area. Some of these pictures are some of my own work that 
you can enhance heat transfer in, in a number of ways. Using heat pipes, here the challenge is the vertical space is quite high that the fin conduction in the vertically by using thick fins is avoided by using these heat pipes, for example. And the heat pipes carry the heat all the way to the top and you have put so many parallel plate fins to dissipate the heat. So then here are some micro honeycomb type heat sinks. These are the foam heat sinks. Then these are honeycomb type structures where we have increased the surface area. But once you have a lot of surface area and if you don't have these so-called slots that are shown here, if it is all closed ducts, array of ducts, then what happens is the duct that is closer to the heater, which is on the bottom, the closer to the heater gets hotter, the air gets hotter there. And these ducts are much cooler. So in, in order to allow some amount of mixing, uh, these vertical slots have been inserted. And then you can do periodic foam sink. And these are called swatch structures or uh, heat sinks where we try to do what is called we trigger instabilities in the heat sinks. I will discuss that in a little bit more detail uh, in the by uh, probably tomorrow. And uh, where we try to make use of instabilities. We want, we know that laminar flow as pressure drop compared to. Uh, turbulent flow. However, turbulent flow um, has higher heat transfer coefficient. Of course, it has higher heat pressure drop as well. So the idea here is to make use of instabilities, flow instabilities. And this is one of those uh, uh, flow instabilities to obtain very close to turbulent heat transfer rates, but keeping close to the laminar flow rate. So we induce what is called flow unsteadiness. We sustain flow unsteadiness, self-sustained oscillations is what is done here. And those flow unsteadiness essentially keeps the flow regime close to the laminar range. And even though there is a minor penalty of pressure drop increase, the performance, the heat transfer performance increases by three to four times. This is one of those methods by which people have shown that one can obtain three to four times improvement in heat transfer four times, not uh, 4%, uh, four times increasing heat transfer, and we'll discuss that. <coughs> so if you really look at the high performance heat sinks, and what you see is that at very low end, uh, where the powers are low, usually a kind of die cast or, uh, or uh, depending on the application you have uh, extrusion or die cast type heat sinks and um, as as power increases then the bonded fins folded fins um, then the so-called thermosiphons or paper chamber attached heat sinks and uh, water cooled plates come into picture so we will discuss some of these aspects uh, here so what is the real challenge in this is that we all know that heat dissipation increases with surface area. The same surface area is responsible for fluid frictional loss as well. So if you increase one thing, the other guy goes up. So the challenge is how to improve heat dissipation by not increasing the fluid frictional losses is the real question that we are trying to address. And why should we do this is because if I look at a processor um, <coughs> a thermal budget, they usually call it a thermal budget because the temperature of the die minus ambient divided by the total power dissipated by die can be split into these parts. This is the so-called package part that we don't have access to. But what we have access to is the thermal interface material to and heat sink design. These, you can see that 42% of the overall thermal resistance is contributed by the heat sink alone. So improving even a good 10% um, <clears throat> percentage of this means uh, a tremendous improvement in the performance. And is there a general principle? 
there is no general principle that allows us to tell you know how to design a heat sink from so that um, pressure drop can be reduced while increasing the heat transfer one such thing is reynolds analogy and recently there is a some new analogy has come up which is the lebesgue analogy this reynolds analogy often in the in our classes we teach as if it is uh, <clears throat> we use the flat plate and uh, we say that uh, <clears throat> what it is is actually um, it is it's an anonymous case in the case of a flow or a flat plate laminar flow or a flat plate case it's an uh, um, it is some sort of a serendipity that it works for that case because the pressure gradient for a flow or a flat plate case is small <coughs> Reynolds analogy in reality is valid only for mixed turbulent flows. What it says is that uh, effective turbulent uh, eddy viscosity is equal to the uh, eddy diffusion. That's all it says. That is the turbulent frontal number is one. That's what the, the Reynolds analogy says. However, we tend to teach as if it is equally valid for any flow situation because we make use of the flat plate keys. So, <clears throat> without going into the details, it is as I have stated here, Reynolds analogy is anomalously valid for laminar flat plate because the pressure gradient is lower there. So, Reynolds analogy, what it does is that gives you a relationship between this, the coefficient of friction and the Stanton number or Nusselt number, however you want to write it. <clears throat> So this, so essentially knowing pressure drop means you can predict heat transfer. That's what it means. That if I know my pressure drop, then I can predict heat transfer. So if I reduce my pressure drop, then I can uh, reduce my heat transfer. So that's, so knowing one thing predicts the other. So Reynolds analogy sort of tells you what best you can do for a given situation. There is something new that is coming up, which is the Levesque analogy. However, I won't get into that. Um, so you can use this to, sort of get it but this doesn't tell me how to design my heat sinks and so on so that is the only way the only analogy that gives us some idea of what may happen in terms of pressure drop uh, once i know pressure drop if this is the budget i have for pressure drop of hand curve then then i can figure out what is the maximum heat transfer i can i, <coughs> I can obtain from reynolds analogy so Um, I think, um, so what we'll discuss in, in tomorrow, for tomorrow's class is that for high performance heat sinks, there are, uh, you know, two main teams that people have addressed. One is geometrical modification. The other one is flow modulation. It is the inlet flow is modulated or it is given some oscillatory signal so that the heat transfer performance is improved. So in the next Tomorrow's class, I'll discuss the, the array of ducts as a way of improving heat transfer, porous media as another way of improving heat transfer, and the so-called laminar flow instabilities as the third way. I'll stop at this point because it just starts to get to the details and uh, pick it up tomorrow. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll be glad to. Uh, how we handle um yeah so this uh ice pack i i'm sorry i just looked at this uh, looked at this question um this uh, ice pack does have turbulent flow models what i'll do is i'll bring up ice pack again tomorrow and i will show an example of how to build a pcb there uh, it can be done very easily if you have the so-called board files it can be done otherwise i'll show you put a board then put key sources there that type i'll show one quick example 
Um, is there a, if there is no other questions, uh, I have shared this link. I'll send it through Moodle as well. I will upload. I have just put one lecture there. I will upload other lectures as well and share them across through that link. Okay, if there is nothing else, uh, thank you for the time and I'll talk to you tomorrow.